subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a man having an interview for a job in a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, Mr. Peters. Please come in and have a seat. Thank you. My name's Gloria McKell. I'm the personnel manager here. Now, before we start the job interview, I just need to get a couple of details from you. Sure. Now, first of all, I'd just like to confirm I have the correct details. Your name is George Peters, isn't it? Yes. And your contact phone number is 0438 637 935? That's right. The man's phone number is 0438 637 935. So 0438 637 935 has been written next to the example on the question paper. Now continue with questions 1 to 4. We have vacancies for a couple of positions in our hotel at the moment. Uh, which position are you interested in applying for? Uh, room service. Room service, right. Now I'd like to find out a little about your employment background. Have you worked in a hotel before or have you been employed in any capacity in the hospitality industry? I've never actually worked in a hotel but I've been a waiter in a couple of different places. Oh, good. I'm sure that experience will come in handy. Also, at the moment, I'm doing a course. Oh, what are you doing? I'm studying tourism management. I'm in the second year of a three-year course. That's good to hear. Oh, by the way, we have quite a few international guests staying here. Do you speak any foreign languages? I did French at high school, and I'm studying Korean as part of my diploma course. And how well do you speak those languages? Well, I can have a simple conversation in French, but my Korean's still fairly basic, though I think it'd come in handy with room service. Good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Well, I've asked you a number of questions. Now I wonder if there's anything you'd like to know about the position or about the hotel. Um, could you tell me what the duties are of doing room service? I mean, I've got a vague idea, but it'd be good to know exactly what it involves. Yes, of course. In fact, your duties would not be limited to room service. There are a few extra things that are now part of the job you're applying for. For instance, the porter used to carry guests' bags to their rooms, but his position has been abolished and that would now be your responsibility. Unlike a waiter, you don't take their orders for food. The kitchen staff does that by phone. Right. If you're on afternoon shift, you also have to take the afternoon newspapers to the guests who've ordered them. But if you're on the morning shift, it's done by the concierge. You're qualified to serve alcohol, aren't you? Yes. Good, because on evening shifts you may have to serve in the hotel bar. What else? 
If a guest calls to say there's a problem with some of the equipment in the room, if it's something simple like one of the light bulbs is blown, then you replace it. But if it's something more complex, say if the TV isn't working, you leave that to the technical staff. I see. Oh no, sorry. There's been a change in that. In fact, now all electrical work has to be done by the technical staff. It's an occupational health and safety issue. Better to be safe than sorry, I suppose. Yes. You don't have to do any of the cleaning, though you do have to remove any dirty plates the guests have used in their rooms. The cleaners are the ones who make sure the fridges have the right amount of drinks and snacks in them. There are a few other duties, but basically room service plays an important role in maintaining guest satisfaction. And so a friendly attitude and efficiency are what's required. Oh, that goes without saying. And could I ask about the pay and conditions? Of course. The pay is $20 per hour and $25 per hour between 10pm and 6am, as well as on Sundays. Right. And what's provided by the hotel? For instance, I suppose there's a uniform to wear. Yes, the hotel provides the jacket and trousers. However, you'd be responsible for doing your own laundry. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Um, what about transport? Like, if we finish a shift around midnight, does the hotel pay for taxi fares to get back home? We used to do that, but now instead we allow staff to park for free on the premises. It can be very hard finding a parking space on the street around this area. Yeah, I had trouble getting a spot when I came here today. Yes, it's a busy area. I might just add that we pride ourselves on having a well-trained staff, so it's a good thing that you're doing your diploma. Yes, it's been a very interesting course so far. Good. Oh, one other thing, we also pay for medical insurance for all our employees as an extra incentive for working with us. Oh, that's good. And until recently, we provided one meal per shift as well, but that's been discontinued. Right, well, I think that's all then. I'll give you a call later in the week and we can talk further. Uh-huh. Well, thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Timothy Curtin is an officer at the Department of Immigration. You will hear him talking to foreign students at a business college regarding visa regulations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 and 12. Now listen and answer questions 11 and 12. Good morning everyone. My name's Timothy Curtin and I work for the Department of Immigration. I've come along today to give you some information about visa regulations so as to make your stay here a bit easier. I'll be telling you about some of the rules for those on student visas and particularly about how to extend your visa. Now, I'm from the Atwood office of the Department of Immigration. At our office, we mainly process work visas. However, in the office where I used to work, I dealt mainly with student visas, which is why I was chosen to speak to you today. For other matters, such as residency applications or medical visas, you need to go to the Hampstead office of the department. For visas for people who are here on holidays, you can go to any office of the Department of Immigration. As you would know, there are certain conditions for people who hold student visas. For instance, if you move, you have to tell your college. The college then has to inform the department by mail, giving both your old and new address. You can change the college where you study, but you have to let the department know that you've enrolled with a new college. 
You're also allowed to work, but remember that the maximum you can work is 15 hours per week because you're here as full-time students, so your main focus has to be on studies. You can also take up to three weeks holidays between courses. If your marital status changes, you have to inform the department and provide us with a copy of the marriage certificate within a month of the wedding. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. What I'd like to do now is go through the steps you have to follow when you want to extend your student visa, because a lot of students have to do that at some point while they're in this country. The first thing you have to do if you want to extend your visa is to pay for the next course you're planning to take. As you know, all courses have to be paid in advance. The course itself has to be of at least four months duration and you are advised to submit your visa application at least two months before the course is due to commence if possible. You need to keep a copy of the receipt of payment and send us the original. We advise that with all the documents you send us that you keep photocopies for yourself just in case any go missing. You'll also have to get a letter from the college you've been attending which states your attendance record at that college. You already know that one of the requirements of a student visa is that you turn up to a minimum of 75% of your classes. If you've been absent for more than 25% of classes, you'll have to provide medical certificates stating that you were ill and unable to attend classes on those days. You then need to fill in a form to extend your student visa. That's Form 726C. You can obtain one by visiting any branch of our department or else you can access it on the internet. At the end of my talk, I'll be handing out a brochure that gives our website address as well as the addresses of department offices throughout the country. On top of that, you'll also need to be able to show that you have the means to support yourself while in this country. It's been estimated that the average student needs $15,000 a year to live on. And for that reason, you will need to prove that you've got at least $6,000 in a bank account. It's got to be a bank account in this country, so $10,000 in a foreign account is of no use. Of course, your passport has to be still valid. And what else? Ah yes, then you'll need three passport photos. Make sure they're fairly recent photos. You then take all these documents and the form down to the Immigration Office, along with your passport. As you can see, there's quite a lot to do, so don't leave it till the last minute. You've got to lodge your application, along with all the documents, at least three weeks before the old visa expires. You have to pay for the visa application too, and that money's non-refundable. You can pay by cash, credit card or cheque. Oh, by the way, it'll cost you $325 to apply for an extension of your student visa. Wait, let me check that. Oh, that's right, it's gone up to $435. Then it'll take about a week to process your application. But we also have to make allowances for weekends and public holidays and at times we have heavy workloads, so it may take as long as 12 working days before you get a reply. You might hear from us before that, but don't contact us before that period of time has passed. There may be a few things we need to ask you about before granting a visa, so there's a chance you'll be invited to an interview just so that we can check up on anything. But we'll let you know if we think that's necessary. Don't worry, if you can't remember all these things I've been talking about, they're all on Form 726C. Well, I think that's about enough from me. Now, do any of you have any questions? 
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two marketing students, Maggie and Mike, talking to their teacher about a seminar presentation that they are preparing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So, you two are going to give a presentation next week about the beauty industry, aren't you? Yeah, we've divided it into two sections. First, we'll be looking at the place of the beauty industry in the economy. Yeah, and then we were going to look at what drives it, as well as some recent trends. That sounds like a good way of doing it. OK, Mike. How are you going to be starting off? Well, first we were amazed at the size of the industry. It's measured in billions, not millions. It's worth $160 billion a year globally. That figure includes products for hair care. They're worth $38 billion alone. Then there's makeup and perfume. I think that's $15 billion. Plus cosmetic surgery, skincare products, diet pills and health clubs. In America, more money is spent on beauty than on education. Really? Yeah. The profits of the leading company in the industry have been growing by 14% a year for the last 13 years. And the industry as a whole has been growing at a rate of 7% a year. In India, sales of anti-ageing creams are growing by 40% a year. And you know the Avon ladies? Well, there are 900,000 of them in Brazil which is more than the number of people in its navy and army. Amazing. Now, just going back a bit, you mentioned cosmetic surgery. Do you have any data on that? Yeah. It's worth $20 billion a year now, and the number of procedures they do in the US has jumped by more than 220% since 1997. Botox injections to remove wrinkles are the main thing done these days but nose jobs and fat removal are still very common. And there's been a real boom in teeth whitening. Also, because the cost of cosmetic surgery has really come down, a lot more people can afford it now. And do you know much about the history of the industry? Well, the modern beauty industry really started up about 100 years ago. When photography became widespread, it became much easier for the public to see idealised standards of beauty and people wanted to buy the products to make themselves look like the models they saw in magazines. By the middle of the century, scientific advances led to changes in the ingredients used in many cosmetics, which made them more affordable and packaging made them more attractive. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now, in the second part of your presentation, you're going to be looking at why people buy the products. Yes, that's right. 
This area is a bit more subjective, and Mike and I disagreed on a few matters. Well, marketing is a hit and miss affair, and it's true what they say that only half of any marketing budget achieves the desired result. I think that's an exaggeration, don't you? Anyway, there are powerful forces at work in the beauty industry because when it comes down to it, there's no avoiding the fact that it's all about image, and that this industry is so successful because it preys on people's hopes and fears. Oh, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? It's only natural to try to look your best. Well, the guy who founded Revlon called the whole business "hope in a jar." Did he? <laughs> well, that's a nice way of putting it. We found a British study of eleven thousand people, which concluded that people who are less attractive earn less money. And that was the case, no matter whether they worked as secretaries, in sales, or as executives. And why do you think that's the case? Well, I reckon one reason is because attractive people have higher expectations and are less willing to put up with being treated badly. Yeah, but there are plenty of good-looking people with low self-esteem. Who do let others walk all over them? I think what it comes down to is that people in general treat good-looking people well, and it starts young. Even three-month-old babies smile longer at faces that adults find attractive. So, who judges what's beautiful and what isn't? We didn't really go into that, but it seems that perceptions of beauty are connected to health and fertility. In some places, people go for shiny hair. In other cultures, women use mascara to make their eyes look bigger and to give themselves a younger look. But a universal indicator of being young and healthy is to have clear skin. And that's why so much money is made from skin cleansers, moisturisers, facial creams, and so on. Well, there are certainly plenty of tricks to this trade. Yeah, and most of them aren't new tricks at all. I think I could make a link at this part of the presentation to what Mike was saying about the early twentieth century, because there's a trend now in the beauty industry to go back to the approach they had a century ago, when they stressed a connection between beauty and health. They got women to have facials and do exercise classes. Now they aim at beauty, but also like people to be fit, not just thin. Oh come on. The industry just scares people into going on diets that can actually harm them, and most of those thin models aren't in good physical condition. They're just hungry. You can't tell just by looking. Anyway, I'm not denying that image is important. In fact, beauty firms spend up to 25 percent of their turnover on advertising. That's incredible, isn't it? And they put just two or three percent into research and development. By comparison. In the pharmaceutical industry, fifteen percent of sales goes into research and development. Well, it sounds like you've got the topic well covered. I'm sure the class will really enjoy your presentation. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk by an archaeological scientist on her latest research. First, you had some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Many of you may remember that in nineteen ninety-one, a couple who were hiking high in the mountains on the border between Italy and Austria found the body of a man who had died five thousand three hundred years ago. 
This corpse was later given the nickname the Iceman. Fortunately, a complete set of clothes and a variety of gear were found on or near the corpse, and these give us further clues as to his identity. Today, I'd like to speak to you about some of the latest findings on the Iceman. Scientists have learned from the Iceman's corpse in the same way as detectives investigating a murder gather clues from the victim's body. The study of the Iceman's bones shows that he was 46 years old at the time of death, which is relatively old for people at that time. It appears that he belonged to a group from central northern Europe rather than to the group of people who lived not far to the south of the spot where his body was found. Yet it seems he may have moved around somewhat during his life. Although exactly where he spent his life is unknown, investigation of his tooth enamel suggests that he grew up in one place and then spent several decades in another area. Samples taken from his stomach and intestines give us an indication of what he'd eaten shortly before his death, including grains, though this does not allow conclusions to be drawn as to what he usually ate. However, samples of his hair show that his usual diet consisted of plants and the meat of several animals. Living in a time long before the development of modern medicine, the tattoos on his back may indicate acupuncture points, yet on the other hand they could simply be a form of body decoration. It seems that he was not in a good state of health in the last six months of his life. There are three lines, known as Bose lines, on the single fingernail that was found. These lines occur if the nail stops growing due to illness and then starts growing again. It was initially assumed that he died of the cold in autumn because of the presence of a piece of fruit that ripens in late summer. Yet there is now strong botanical evidence that he died in spring. This is because pollen of the hop hornbeam tree was found in his intestines, and that small tree blooms only in late spring. So he may have breathed some in or drunk some water containing the pollen shortly before his death. So what else do we know about the Iceman? He ate a primitive form of wheat, which was baked into bread on an open fire. Although leaves of moss were found in his intestines, it appears that moss was not part of his diet, but had probably entered his mouth by accident. In those days, the local people had no paper bags or plastic wrapping, and so used moss to pack food in. Moss was a very versatile plant with different varieties that grew far to the north, being used by the Vikings as toilet paper. The equipment found around the body gives us many clues as to his way of life. He was well prepared for climbing through the mountains. He had a jacket made from deer hide and goat hide, and a pair of shoes made from the skin of both goat and bear, and then insulated with plant material. Over the top of it all, he was wearing a cape made from grass and bast, which is made from bark. This could give us a clue as to his occupation. In fact, this cape resembles capes still worn by shepherds in the Balkans. And the site where he was found is near an area where shepherds traditionally take their flocks in summer. Yet the theory that he was a shepherd has little else to support it. It's been proposed that he was a hunter, due to the fact that he was carrying a bow and some arrows. Some earlier ideas that he was a warrior or a trader of flint have been abandoned for lack of any supporting material. The Iceman was found lying on a large rock, and so it was believed initially that he had fallen asleep on the rock and then died. However, the consensus now is that he died nearby and then floated into that position during periods when the ice thawed. There are several indicators for this. First, the awkward position of his left arm. Second, the position of his right hand, which was stuck under another rock. Third, 
the missing outer layer of skin, and the fact that some of his belongings were a few metres from the body. Despite these interesting findings, there are still many things that we don't know about the Iceman. What was he doing up there high in the mountains, apparently by himself? Did he die from exhaustion and cold while running away from danger? We may never know exactly what the cause of death was, because this would require an autopsy, which has not been allowed as it would cause too much damage to the corpse. When the body was first removed, it was thought to be that of a missing mountain climber, and a number of people disturbed the site, wrecking a good part of the evidence in the process. But hopefully, with further research, we will be able to solve some of the mysteries that still surround the Iceman, who's already taught us so much about the way of life at that time. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.